Hi, my name is Phil. I like talking about politics and we may be several years away from the general election that many of us would be desperate for now. But that doesn't mean that none of us will be going to the Westminster polls anytime soon because a Labour MP has resigned, which means there's going to be a by-election in Hartlepool of all places very soon. And this has the potential to be pretty bad news for Labour. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. Uh, so yeah, back, back, back to this, back to this. Um, oh, people didn't quite like the polo shirt and jumper and then they didn't like what I was wearing yesterday. Maybe I've just got the wardrobe that's fit for radio anyway. <sighs> Labour trickiness. Uh, I don't really know how to read this one, so I'll go through what my thoughts are. The current member, for Hartlepool, Mike Hill for Labour. Uh, he won what might have been a tight contest for the seat against Richard Tice in 2019, who is chairman of the Brexit Party, or Reform UK, whatever they're calling themselves now. A very high profile Brexiteer is the key point. Now, without the Brexit Party fielding Tice, it's possible that the Conservatives would have won this seat in 2019. You could almost consider Hartlepool to essentially have been a seat that Labour lost in 2019. Um, I'll go over the arithmetic later in the video. But when the 2019 general election results came in, I worked out a few things and uh, figured that Labour would have lost another round about 20 or so seats if the Brexit party had stood down candidates in all of the seats that the Tories could win. That being said, if they'd stood candidates in all seats, as Nigel Farage promised to do, then the Conservatives would not have won their majority. It is worth remembering that the 2019 general election was not the Conservatives' win, although they are the beneficiaries, it was the Brexit party's win. They didn't get a single MP but they succeeded in playing kingmaker and in doing so shifted the Conservative Party very far to the right, meaning that their paymasters were very pleased. But the point is that Labour basically lost about 20 or so seats than is officially recorded. We just got away with it because of the Brexit Party's what would appear to be inconsistent attitude towards fielding candidates. Now, Hartlepool wasn't one of those 20 that I'm talking about. But it was borderline. It could have been lost. Very difficult to say for certain. And now it's up for grabs. The Labour MP, Mike Hill, has been up to no good, it seems. Now, I don't know the full details, so I'm not going to try and clumsily explain here, particularly when it's down to allegations, um, other than the fact that topically it involves allegations, as I say, of sexual harassment. Now, they must be credible because Starmer had wanted Hill to resign some time ago. But he has only now done so after, you know, quite a bit of pressure. The timing makes it tricky. <laughs> I mean, you can say good on Labour for pressuring an MP to resign, um, which they have no power to force, by the way. They have no power to force. You know, an MP wins an election, that's all there is to it. They are an MP. Just because they happen to belong to a party, the party can kick them out, they're still that MP. You know, they've chosen to do it for the good of the party. Um, you know, and as I say, it must be credible allegations, still allegations, but it must be credible allegations of misconduct in a situation where, let's face facts, the Conservatives would always have covered for them. But Hartlepool isn't straightforward at all. It's not like a safe Labour seat where it's like, look, resign, this is going to look bad for us, we'll get someone else in. The Conservatives could absolutely win this seat, and some people will actually make them favourites. The Conservatives are definitely up for this as well, by the way. See, for them, it's a no-lose situation. For Labour, it's a no-win situation, no matter what happens. Um, expect the government to throw everything at the town. It was a heavily vote leave area. It was about 70% voted leave. OK, time has passed. You'd, you might think that the realities of Brexit might have turned support for it away. That doesn't seem to be happening just yet. In nowhere near enough parts of the country, in fact, is that seem to be happening. The by-election will effectively be a no-win for Starmer. He cannot really win out of it because if Labour wins the seat and it's fairly tight, as you'd expect, he hasn't gained anything. <laughs> it was already Labour. It just stays Labour. Um, the only way he can win is if it's by a larger majority than originally. Um, then that is a win. But I'm not sure if that's on the cards. 
You can tell from statements from senior figures in Labour when they've been asked about it, they're not confident of winning the seat back uh, in even a tight result race. So what if the Conservatives gain the seat? Absolute disaster. I mean, the Conservatives themselves will be crowing. Of course they will. Uh, it will inevitably give them a bit of a boost as well. Um, I don't care about that, though. The seat was probably lost in 2019. Well, it was borderline, but you know, there's a good chance it was lost in 2019. The real danger will be from within Labour. The hypocrites constantly trying to undermine the leadership when they called the same action a cardinal sin under Corbyn will take it as, oh, this is proof that Labour are going backwards under Starmer. This is a fight to simply stand still for Labour at best. Um, they will have to stop at nothing to win it, of course, but they know the Conservatives will not only use their party machine, but the public purse, our taxpayer money, to win over those voters as well. The Conservatives already have um, a bit of a vaccination boost in the polls. Yes, supplies are looking a bit ropey at the moment. You're obviously always going to go through these periods where supply becomes an issue. They were bound to do so at some point. Um, I'm going to bet, though, there's not going to be any delays in vaccinating people of Hartlepool all of a sudden. I shouldn't be surprised if we see promises of, of more investment going their way as well. It won't appear, of course, but the promises may be enough to win the seat. So what does the arithmetic say about the chances? Well, without the benefit of reliable polling specifically from Hartlepool, we'll take a look at the 2019 election results first. Now, Labour won a majority of nearly 4,000 votes. Comfortable, but the Brexit party won over 10,000 votes. Now, the question is, will they stand this time? It won't be the Brexit party, of course, but the Reform UK party, but it's the same outfit run by the same people. I know Nigel Farage has pretended to step away from frontline politics again, uh, but it's not the first time he's done that. He just doesn't have anything to gripe about at the moment. He'll be back when he does. But it won't be him standing anyway. It would be Richard Tice. Now, if he stands, that will help Labour enormously. In that particular case, I think you would make Labour favourites. Um, even if Tice doesn't stand to get anywhere near as many seats this time round, it would take it just enough off, I think. The party's backers as well would probably have no reason to block him as such. You know, they don't necessarily want Labour to win the seat, but they don't need the Conservatives to win another seat. Johnson already has more than enough of a majority to do whatever he likes now, and um, the powers that be have got him in their pocket. You know, he, he's removing our freedoms at a rate of knots. Everything is proceeding according to plan, no matter who wins Hartlepool. But I'm going to work on the assumption that Tice does not stand. He has no chance of winning. Uh, so why would he? It's effort for him. So let us also assume, just for the moment, that voting behaviour wouldn't have much changed compared to 2019. So let's imagine that, and I know this isn't quite true, I'll go over some other scenarios in a moment, but let us say that those Brexit Party voters, because there's no Brexit Party candidate, would vote for either Labour or the Conservatives. Now, what, from what I could tell from polling through 2019 as it developed, you would generally say that, I mean, most Brexit Party votes would come from people who'd normally vote for the Conservatives, but some, distressingly, would come from people who'd vote for Labour. And, and it tended to be between a quarter and a third of Brexit Party votes coming from what would be traditional Labour votes with the rest from Tory voters. So let's say a third, the upper end of that, not only because it works in the Conservatives' favour, but also because it's more likely in a heavy pro-Brexit, traditionally Labour area. That would yield, if you split it like that, a result of 18,998 votes for Labour, 18,938 votes for the Conservatives. So Labour would win, only just. But there are other things to consider, not least of which, you know, that's me clumsily applying, just saying, oh, a third go one way and two thirds go the other. And it's too close to be able to say that with any confidence. But a couple of other things need to consider here. So because this by-election won't just have the same voters voting in the same way, there are, I mean, I suppose three things really to consider. One, sorry, Corbyn fans, has to be said, the number one reason for traditional Labour voters just not turn up at the polls at all was Jeremy Corbyn. Um, it doesn't matter whether you think that the, the criticism was fair or not, it was a fact. Uh, that was all there was to it. Boris Johnson in 2019 only won a few hundred thousand more votes than Theresa May when she crashed uh, to that, not quite lost, but lost her majority in 2017. 
Labour lost uh, well over 2 million votes there. Well over 2 million. Um, Corbyn is no longer the leader. This suggests that there are traditional Labour voters who didn't turn up at all in 2019, that if that was their reason, they no longer have that reason not to turn up this time. So they may be prepared to turn out this time. That, of course, works in Labour's favour. Can't quantify it, though. The second thing is how the polls are looking. Now, again, I don't know about Hartlepool specifically, unfortunately. That would be more useful. But the national outlook is, is much the same. You know, the polls not looking great for Labour right now. Obviously, what matters is where they're going to be in May. Um, you know, and that could change for the better or for the worse. I hope for the better. Um, I think too, they'll, they'll be turned around too late for this by-election, though. I think autumn is when they're going to really start to turn. But the point is they are no worse now than in the 2019 general election. So Labour are not seen as less popular now than when they lost the general election and the Conservatives are not more popular going by the polls. Um, finally, there's the candidate to consider. Now, frankly, the choice of candidate is often not as major a factor as people inside a party would like to think. Um, let's be honest, unless they're famous, it doesn't. people are voting for the party, not the personality. However, Labour look like selecting a local doctor for the candidacy. Uh, pros and cons here. Obvious pro is that um, he has been treating people during the pandemic. He has been vaccinating people during the pandemic and beyond, of course. NHS workers are very popular in the north of England and it will not be easy for the Conservatives to attack him, assuming he has no skeletons in his closet. That being said, he's also very anti-Brexit. Now, far be it from me to consider that a drawback is very much a virtue in my books, but thinking strategically, the Conservatives are delighted with this. They are going to push that heavily in their campaign. They're going to use it as an attack. Now, I'm not sure how much it will bite, because in reality, Brexit has happened. It's all right saying, oh yeah, but Hartlepool's a pro, very strong Brexit voting place. Okay, fine. Uh, it doesn't seem, though, to me credible if the Tories try and claim that this Labour's Dr Paul Williams wants to reverse Brexit. It's like, well, how's he going to do that then? The Conservatives are in power. Brexit's already happened. The Conservatives are in power. He's not going to be able to. Even if people from Hartlepool know that, you know, um, as, as limited as many are. Sorry, you've got a reputation. Don't pull that face. You hung that monkey thinking it was a French spy. Never living that down. Never. Now, finally, in terms of my thoughts, so when I first heard the news, I was pretty distraught. I thought, oh, the timing is terrible. Had it been last year, okay. If it was in autumn this year, okay. Now, I mean, it's not going to be now, but like May, no, no. Um, you know, because if the by-election had happened last year, it would have been much easier. Labour had caught in the polls or even overtaken every now and then. Uh, it was a wall-to-wall -wall disaster for the Conservatives, particularly in the northern part, the Red Wall. It was looking very, very bad. The polling was suggesting that had there been a general election at pretty much any point, um, you know, from in the autumn, that, you know, the, the red wall would have crumbled. Well, it would have, sorry, it would have gone back red. <laughs> but when you consider everything carefully, Labour, of course, have a chance in this. It, at first, I thought, oh, they're, they're buggered. But you look at it and think, there, are, there is a chance. There are a few positives in their favour, definitely. I'm not sure I'm confident enough to call them favourites, though. Because the Conservatives already have a well-oiled campaigning machine, already set up, they know it works. Labour is having to completely rebuild it, and it's not fit yet. The Conservatives are getting their boost in the polls from peeling back the lockdown that was only in place due to their own incompetence. But they're getting a boost from the fact that they're removing the thing they put in place because they were too stupid to put in a zero Covid policy. Also, the vaccine rollout, that if they get any credit at all, and they deserve some, it's only because they let the NHS take care of it this time and not giving the job to one of Dominic Cummings' dodgy mates. Speaking of dodgy mates, the Conservative candidate will, of course, promise much-needed investment for the area. Now, voters will know that a Labour MP cannot possibly do this because whoever they elect this time round isn't possibly going to be uh, triggering a change of government. It's not a general election, it's a by-election. They know they can change their mind in 2024. You know, uh, the Conservatives have already promised a free port to be set up in Hartlepool. Naturally, this will not help the people of Hartlepool. It never helps. Wherever you have a free port, it never helps the local community. 
So this shouldn't be a strong campaign line. Unless, of course, the people of Hartlepool are the sort who think that Brexit is a great idea and that monkeys are French spies. All of that adds up, of course, to a complete toss-up as far as I can tell. Um, again, without reliable local polling, um, I cannot tell between Labour and the Conservatives. Uh, looks like a toss-up to me. Could go either way. Like I said, if Labour win it, doesn't really win anything for Labour, but it does tread water. If Labour lose it, catastrophic. But those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, don't forget to click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, please also click the Patreon link for details. And until next time, I'll see you later.